seven. On this best of seven series between the best of seven series. Welcome to the best of seven podcast. Welcome to the Best of Seven Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Plant from Sensedoc. In this episode, number seven of the Best of Seven Podcast, we are going to discuss many things, especially the Last Dance documentary, a new National Hockey League memo, which says that June a draft will be done in June, which very much benefits the Detroit Red Wings and your Ottawa Sanders. But before we get into anything, a couple of things to speak about. Firstly, a tragedy over the week. Uh, a Canadian Navy helicopter crashed in the Greek islands, killing, uh, well, presume, killing one, uh, Sub-Lieutenant Abigail Cabro, uh, and five other members are presumed dead. So I hope that they find and any survivors, but thoughts and prayers, that is just an absolute tragedy. Uh, they were stationed out of Nova Scotia, I believe, and uh, Nova Scotia has really been hit hard uh, the last couple of weeks with tragedy. So it's just a terrible time. Thoughts and prayers, of course. And, you know, you know, it's just one of those things where, you can't predict it, but when it happens, you just got to shake your head and just sulk, you know? It's a terrible thing. On a brighter note, though, in a couple of weeks, Scott Sabrin will be joining the show, the Ottawa Sanders Forward, number 49, will join episode number nine of the Best of Seven podcast. This guy right here, Scott Sabrin, will be joining the show. <laughs> we're looking <laughs> we're looking very forward to Good. Sabs to join the show, so stay tuned in the next couple of weeks for updates, promos, etc. We are really, really excited. Uh, Scott Sabrin has a great uh, story uh, through the minors uh, to the National Hockey League getting a contract, scoring a goal in his NHL debut. Can't wait for it. Noah, what about you? Oh, I'm excited. I was all I was ready for him to come up to the NHL, and when he scored that first goal in his first game, that was it was something else, especially against the Toronto Maple Leafs. But we'll talk about yeah. that more in episode nine. It's just such a unique story where we're very fortunate to get a guy with such a great story onto the show i just can't wait i think the viewers are, and listeners are going to love it i think we're going to enjoy it i think this is going to be the most fun interview uh, we're going to do because you know it's such a unique story right right anyways let's move forward now just wanted to give you a heads up cannot <laughs> wait for that to drop um as we speak currently episode number five and six of last of the last dance documentary are probably up uh i think it dropped like an hour ago on Netflix, ESPN, and, ev- and everything. So let's get into the Last Dance documentary. Uh, apparently, Kobe Bryant will be making an appearance in episode number five and six of the documentary. Noah, what do you think that's going to look like? I'm not sure. It's got it's got to be like the first meeting between yeah. MJ and Kobe and how they've affected each other. But I, I'm I'm really excited to see how that's tied into it for sure. Yeah, I was I was reading some things and uh, apparently uh, the first real meeting that Kobe and MJ uh, had was the 1998 All-Star Game. That's what I read on the score, and I believe that's what's going to be discussed a lot in the uh, probably episode number five. Uh, I think it's just going to be unique to see, of course, rest in peace to Kobe Bryant. I, I think it's going to be emotional and just, just inspiring to see two legends of the game on the, on the TV at once, just two masters of the game. I can't wait to watch it later. Uh, this – the Last Dance documentary, it's, it's a phenomenal series, Noah. I, I've never seen anything like it. It's so unique. It brings you, like, the little facts, like Michael Jordan playing a golf game in the middle of the postseason run. Who would have thought, who would have knew about that, yeah. playing against his enemy opponent? Like, these little things, it just ties you into the, to the game of basketball. And on top of that, during a time where there's no live sports, it kind of fills that void of sports. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's great to see, especially all like the backstories of uh, the main uh, pieces of that uh, dynasty. You got Jordan Pip and Rodman, and of course, course the coach Phil Jackson. I, I, I so far it's been very enjoyable, uh, very interesting to see what they think now versus what they thought then. Um, all these little pieces, or uh, the story of Jerry Krause and how he was really good, and then he sort of <laughs> took a tumble with uh, yeah. with his uh, relationship with the players. Uh, I'm very excited to see the rest of this uh, series for sure. Well, what I'll say is you look at the series in episode number two, and th- I think either two or three were my favorite episodes of the podcast, and, uh, not of the podcast, of the documentary. I think it's important to note, though, that Noah and I are only four episodes in because I think that, like I just said, episode five and six dropped like an hour ago. So we're going to have to watch that after filming this. However, just watching like Dennis Rodman and Scottie Pippen, like they're, they're not forgotten, but they're overshadowed because of Michael Jordan, obviously the greatest of all time, the GOAT. It makes sense. But like just watching Dennis Rodman describe how he um, studied the game to get rebounds and like 
it was it was just like I'm not a I'm not a basketball guy, you know. I'm like clearly I'm a hockey guy, and just sort of getting that inside the brain of a Hall of Famer was so unique, so cool. And Dennis Robin cer- certainly a character, right? Like right. <laughs> the story of him going to Las Vegas uh, for like 48 hours, they let him go. He ended up being for like 70 or 80 hours. And the, the fa- there's a famous clip of him uh, drinking a beer and then getting on a motorcycle and driving away. Mm-hmm. These are things you will never see again in professional sports. It's just so unique, just like Robin. Yeah, I, I got to say my favorite episode was the first one, actually, just because I liked seeing Jor- like Jordan. He's the main part of that dynasty and just seeing where he came from. Uh, he was a third overall pick. Michael Jordan, a third I know. overall pick. Obviously, I know. The, the first pick was a really good player, but the second pick, the Portland Trailblazers, I think they took a center or something. So they needed yeah, that position. Somebody random. But because they weren't going to take somebody. Michael regardless, but geez imagine what could have happened if he went first or second overall that could be a whole new story and and, yeah and on top of that on top of that the seattle supersonics who drafted michael jordan traded michael jordan those same supersonics had kevin durant can you imagine kd with mj holy cow i don't see how they don't dominate the league for years like can you imagine michael jordan with kevin durant can just Two of the best basketball players to ever play it. That would have been ooh, crazy. Ooh, but there's a little hot take. I wouldn't put KD number two. K- K- no, no, two drawn, of, but... two of, two of. Oh, two of, okay, yeah, yeah. Two of, like the yeah. top 10, 15, 20 yeah. players. Something, something like that. I'm not for sure. I, I'm not that high on Kevin Durant either, but like I'll give I'll get I'll say top maybe top twenty five players all time, Kevin Durant, somewhere in there. Well but what I'll say is that's a good team. Yeah, for sure. And like we just – just the inside depth of, like – they even re, sort of rekindled the beef between the Detroit Pistons and the Chicago Bulls with, like, Isaiah Thomas and the fact they didn't shake hands after the Bulls finally slayed the Dragon and beat the Pistons. Those Pistons, man, wow. Just absolute laying the body. I've That's some fun basketball to watch. Dangerous, and I'm glad it's not like that anymore. You can really hurt people. But it's definitely entertaining to watch. It looks like football and hockey out there. I've never seen basketball like that. Never. It, re- it reminds me of the Broad Street Bullies, the Philadelphia Honestly. Flyers. When they were yeah. so dominant, they, they had that same style of play. And it really got into the heads of their opponents. And that, that, it was very effective. And there were no rules against it. So they did what they had to do. They won two championships. And the Pistons were a real good team. They yeah. had a lot of good defenders. And, of course, even Dennis Rodman was on that team before he went to the Bulls. I, I I love seeing the backstory of even the Pistons team and how mm-hmm. they were always the big brother over the Bulls for those few years. And then when they got Rodman, they, the Bulls went over the top. I agree. Uh, it's just fascinating. It's We see that in a lot of sports where a team always has that one team they can't beat, sort of like Calgary and the Ducks. I'm not comparing the two, but the, and like the Calgary Flames lost to the Ducks in Anaheim like 25 times in a row. Something it's There's always those weird type of – this, this team always has it over the other team, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at some advanced stats. I was watching a YouTube video the other day about Michael Jordan and what they're not really telling you in the documentary. 71 players have beaten Michael Jordan more than three-plus times. 310, yes, 310 players who have faced Michael Jordan, I mean, who Michael Jordan has faced, have never beaten Michael Jordan. And one see the dominance of the Detroit Pistons against Michael Jordan, Isaiah Thomas, the Hall of Famer for the, for the Detroit Pistons, was 31 and 26 in his career against Michael Jordan, one of the only players to have that many games played against him and an above 500 percentage. So that just shows how good Isaiah Thomas was, how fierce and dominant that Detroit Pistons team was, and how Michael Jordan really struggled against, well, didn't struggle. You know, he dominated the game, got 45 points like on average, but the team just struggled to find a way to win until they did, you know? Yeah, it, it was sort of like um, how Alex Ovechkin was sort of seen uh, with the Washington Capitals for this longest time. He's this great player who gets 50, 60 goals a season, but he couldn't make it over the hump. He was always losing to, like, the Boston Bruins. He lose to the Rangers. He was losing to the, the Montreal Canadiens once, or the Pittsburgh Penguins a few yep. times. And once he got some help, they traded for stuff at the deadline. That enabled – Alex Ovechkin to become the great player and have a championship under his belt. There's a lot of these situations where there are players at the start of their career 
like LeBron James is another one who is sort of LeBron on his own James. island. <laughs> Who's sort of on his own island, but then when he gets a little bit of help, all that, oh, that's all he needs. And then that just unlocks so much more potential. And seeing how dominant even Jordan was before he had Pippen and Rodman, where he was getting 42, 45 points a game, it's and crazy. they were still losing by like 20 points. That is a crazy thing too. to me. It just shows that he was dominant from the start until the finish. And, yeah. and that, that was something I really like about Michael Jordan. It shows for me that he's the greatest of all time, 100%. It's, it, it shows the difference between um, a, a champion and someone that was close to being a champion is you have to have the will to win. And Michael Jordan has that will. Just watching – the way he practiced and the way he l- led himself and, you know, the way he dominated. And even in practice, he went as hard as he can and didn't, he didn't expect anything less from his teammates. Sure, he's a true leader. And I know it's tough. And uh, there was an example when he was on an airplane with one of his teammates. And he kind of called him out for drinking too much and this and that. Uh, you know, yeah, was, was it rude? Was it awkward? Yes. But I think that shows how Michael Jordan had the best interest in the players to win a championship for Chicago. That's unique. A lot of people will keep their mouths shut, but the GOAT, Michael Jordan, not him. He will make sure you know that is not acceptable. All he wants is a championship. And you know what? Once they started winning championships, they couldn't stop, just like LeBron James. Right, yeah. Like, Mike was just – he had probably the biggest will to win. He had – I don't think there's been a player in professional sports who has thought more about winning consistently – than Michael Jordan and Michael Jordan also has the results to back it up it's not like some some fourth line power forward in the NHL who always has this winning mentality it's the best player of all time in Michael Jordan and he just there there was no one no one in sports who has had that same kind of mentality in the game out of the game during the game before the game it was Michael Jordan, and the only he's one like the I, ultimate, he's the ultimate winner of sports. Of course, I think the only one that I'd probably say would match or sort of match Michael Jordan's intensity and game prep, and et cetera, like what you said, would be Kobe Bryant. Uh, you know, Mamba, uh, he was a different animal. He's definitely a top ten, top five player ever in the National Basketball Association. Um, but you know, that's why I'm excited to watch episode five and six, which we'll definitely touch up on in the next episode. Uh, for sure, um, because you know what, Kobe's going to be in it. It's going to be the two. It's going to be rarer way, rare episode where you can see two competitors who are pretty identical. You know, with their game prep and the way they dominated and led themselves and led their teams. Um, before we wrap our little segment up on the be- the Last Dance documentary, I want to ask this question. I know Michael Jordan's a goat, and I'll die with that statement. Michael Jordan is the best basketball player to ever live without a doubt. But do you think, to the people that think LeBron James, LeBron James is the best player, do you think this could change their minds? Because honestly, I think it does. Oh, 100%. Um, I think that that would give Jordan a little bit of an unfair advantage, though, because LeBron James does not have a full phenomenal documentary about him. Yeah, but for sure. I, I just don't understand that argument from the get-go. That Michael Jordan... He was a phenomenal player from the start to the finish. And yes, LeBron James is the same, but I just don't see LeBron James as consistently at the top as Michael Jordan was. LeBron James is always one of the top two or three best players in the league, but he was not doing things that Jordan was. You just watch Jordan play for a little bit, the crazy maneuvers he's doing, the shots like these. He will get fouled from his back and he'll – grandma shot it behind him and in the hoop Probably. and that's like a norm for michael jordan and that would how he that would be how he get like an and one and for me lebron james just isn't quite that obviously he's probably the second best player for me he's the second best player of all time but i think the I gap agree. between him and jordan is pretty big it's what i say what i what i'd say sorry to interrupt what no. i would say is michael jordan without a doubt during his prime before he retired and then went to, to the Chicago White Sox and then joined the, I think it was Orlando Magic, right? Something like that. Yeah, hold on. I got, I got my Orlando Magic ball for this episode. Uh, but, you know, before he retired, played a little bit of baseball, and then came back to the Magic. It was without a doubt that Michael Jordan was not, was not one of. He was the best basketball player in the league by far, without a question. LeBron James, 
I say is the best in the league right now, and he will be until he retires. But you can make the argument. You couldn't make the argument with when Michael Jordan was playing, but you can make the argument, oh, James Harden's the best, uh, you know, scorer because, you know, just the way he can carry himself and dominate a game in and game out. As an example, I'm not saying James Harden's better. I don't think he is. But you can make – there's people you can make the argument with. Uh, but with Michael Jordan, no. You can't make that argument. And on top of that, I think what was really interesting before we wrap this up for this segment was people's – People say when Michael Jordan isn't the top um, player, they say LeBron James is. One of their main points is it's because Michael Jordan, all we see from him is highlights, right? Uh, and LeBron James, we see everything. But in the documentary, they said those aren't highlights. That's just Michael Jordan playing basketball. And I think that really ties the bow into what Michael Jordan is, a phenomenal basketball player. And I don't think I will ever be able to see anything – I don't think I can see any bad play from Michael Jordan because the NBA professionals say there aren't any. So, yeah, you know, he, like, he's the best. He's the best. He, you watch a game, you go to a Bulls game to see Jordan, you're going to see things that you've never even seen before. Yeah. And that, that was the great thing about Michael Jordan when he was playing is that you just know, you, not only do you make your game plan around Michael Jordan – like, which has been seen before with other players. Like when the Senators were in the playoffs, they would make a plan around shutting down Eric Carlson or whatever. Yeah, but it's not just that. It's that they would go back to the locker room after the game and realize that they made this whole big game plan to stop Michael Jordan, and they didn't do it. Not Because <laughs> they can't stop Michael Jordan. That's just how good he was. He was a wrecking ball, and you could have put – a thousand feet of wall and you still would have found a way to break through without going back and forth. Michael Jordan was a different animal. He was in a different league of his own, the goat without a question. And if you disagree with that, you know, you're entitled to your opinion, but it's clearly wrong in my opinion. Like I just, I don't see it. Uh, let's move forward now uh, with the national hockey league memo uh, that could see the senators guaranteed with picks three, at least with the picks at number three and four. Uh, let me go through what Chris Stevenson said uh, about the M NHL memo uh, from Sportsnet. Chris Stevenson said, if the draft lottery proposal outlined in tonight's National Hockey League memo becomes reality, Detroit would be guaranteed number one or number two overall in the draft. Ottawa could do no worse than them owning number three and four. New Jersey, Buffalo, Montreal, and Chicago could not jump beyond number two, three, four, five, respectively. So basically what this means is Ottawa is guaranteed one of – Byfield, Stutzel, and of course, uh, maybe potentially Alexis Lafreniere. And this means Detroit is a, has a 50% chance of getting first overall. So I believe Ottawa's chances stay around 27, 28% for first overall, but they are guaranteed two top four picks, two picks in the top four. I believe the only fault about this plan for that doesn't really benefit Ottawa is the fact that they cannot have the first and second overall pick in a row. But besides that, I, I'll take, one of Lafreniere, Byfield, and Stutzel any day. I don't know about you, know. You know, uh, knowing the knowing the luck that we've had in this uh, <laughs> in the past yeah. couple of years, I'll take yeah. getting guaranteed third and fourth because I'd rather third and fourth than having fifth and sixth. And Amen. that's a pretty realistic uh, possibility without this memo. So I'll take the guarantee for Byfield or Lafreniere or Stutzel or whoever. All these great players – they're all going to be great on Ottawa. So I'm, I'm just waiting for the draft. Is it going to be in June? I don't know. <laughs> I think for the benefit of the game itself and the integrity of the National Hockey League, having the draft in June really makes no sense before the season is done, in my opinion. Uh, but I understand the move for why the National Hockey League wants to do it. After seeing the ratings for the NFL draft and even the CFL draft really did well, People are clearly starving for live sports. And this, in my opinion, is an opportunity for the NHL to jump in on that and cash in on some money. Uh, that's the primary reason they're pushing forward on this June draft. Um, you know, there's, besides that, majority of the National Hockey League doesn't want this to happen for obvious reasons. It puts them out of the possibility of getting a generational talent and gives Detroit a, a coin flip getting a generational talent. It gives Ottawa two picks in the top four. So if I wasn't a Sens fan, I'd be like, what the hell? Like, this makes no sense. But as a Sens fan, clearly biased, I'm very happy. But as a National Hockey League fan, I'm looking at this, and it just, you know, I'm happy as a Sens fan, but once again, as an NHL fan, 
I don't want the draft in June. It should be pushed back after the season and keep it like normal. It just makes things too complicated in my opinion. The thing is, is the season going to actually continue? Uh, Obviously, I don't see a world where the season doesn't continue, Mm -hmm. honestly. And in which case, I would agree that I think that the draft should be after the season like it always is. Yeah. It's just going to be hard to schedule this season and then next season and the draft and the free agency and having an actual offseason because they will need it. The players will need it because hockey's a tough sport. But I'm curious what's going to happen. well, there, who knows? Who knows? Are, you never know what developments are going to happen. And there are rumors about a lot of different the yes, hubs yes. in the Toronto, the hubs in Arizona. Columbus. Um, I, I just I, I just hope it all works out, honestly. Yeah. Honestly, it was interesting what you said about how the offseason would be affected, and I agree. We don't know when hockey is going to return. I'm expect, it's expected to be returning sometime in July with May having – some workouts, June being a training camp, and then July um, being starting sometime in July, having the season start for some bit. I don't know how what the actual logistics are going to be, but that seems to be like the timeline we're going along. Um, but it looks like the 2020-2021 the season will be pushed back to December. So it's going to really change the dynamic of the National Hockey League for a few, a few years to come, but that's most sports leagues uh, with how they're dealing with COVID-19. Uh, it's unprecedented, right? So you're making decisions on the fly and without a doubt, the next two or three years of professional sports are going to be affected in a negative way. But I think I'd rather have sports than no sports at all. So just give me the sports. Just give yeah, me the sports. Please, right? please. We need the sports. We've been struggling here. Really? Yeah, I'm watching sports. marble racing. I'm watching marble racing and I, I got to tell you, I'm getting way too excited about it. So I'd really, really like to watch Brady Kachuk score some goals again, and Jeez. Jimmy Garoppolo throw some beautiful touchdowns and interceptions. <laughs> come on, come on! At least we don't have uh, a second round uh, draft pick being our backup quarterback. Bowl in my <laughs> lifetime. That's all I'm gonna say. Very soon for hey, we've been to the Super Bowl twice in my lifetime. Okay, we should have won both. Uh, oh, Torrey Smith should have caught that ball the last 40 seconds, and Kyle Shanahan should have just ran the ball in the last six minutes in the second Super Bowl. I'm not mad at all about it. I'm I'm just fine. Moving forward now before I lose my mind because that really gets me mad every time. Uh, the potential return of sports is in question, and it's looking more and more likely that the only way professional sports can come back is by a quarantined village for the athletes. And we looked at a report. No one and I were really talking about this. It was an interesting idea. Sort of like an Olympic village, you know, the Olympics – all the athletes have a village to where they can stay. So this kind of puts that idea into play for the major sports leagues in North America. MGM Resorts International pitched a proposal to several leagues, including the NHL, NBA, and Major League Soccer. I believe uh, NFL might be involved as well. These plans would involve holding sporting events in Las Vegas on a quarantine segment of the Las Vegas trip. So if you haven't seen images of Las Vegas currently, it is a deserted, it looks deserted, at the, um, of course, at the Las Vegas Strip because there's no tourists because we are in the middle of a pandemic, if you haven't realized. So this idea is fun because on top of bringing back sports, which I think we all can agree would be very beneficial to everybody to just get their minds off of everything, having a quarantine segment of the Las Vegas Strip will, in my opinion, should allow the families to still be together and not separated. That was a big concern from, for example, the National Hockey League Players Association. The big problem or issue with hockey returning is the question of, will the families be divided? In this proposal from MGN Resorts International, I think that families would be able to be in this uh, quarantine segmented um, cutout of of the Las Vegas Strip. Um, And if that's the case, I definitely can see some of the major leagues agreeing to a proposal like this. What do you think, Noah? You know, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, situation because you have a full sports league of players, and you have to account for all the families of those players. It's thousands and thousands of players, and yeah. NBA, NHL, getting to five. What are, what are you going to have to move five to ten thousand people in all of this? Probably uh, even more. One village. It's hard to imagine. Hard. Um, I don't. I don't see how sports would go on without. If the families are isolated from their uh, from from the players, but 
it's to me i just don't see how it can run like that i i it's so hard to make that village I, there's too many things that can go wrong and what happens if a player one player gets uh contracts the virus and this can all go spiraling down again and it was that just will, hype and that will that will always be a risk right uh, of one player getting it and it's very i'm gonna be honest when sports returns, it's very likely a player is going to get it in one of the major leagues during the season again. It's, it's nearly impossible. Uh, it's, unless everyone's cut off, it's the way this thing spreads, I don't see how that's possible. But what I do see in the segmented thing for the Las Vegas Strip is an opportunity for these major league sports, for the major leagues to get together and find a way to get these families to stay together during the quarantine. And you got to remember Las Vegas is losing hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars of tourism money going into the Las Vegas economy. It's gone. It is gone. And now this gives Las Vegas an opportunity to recoup some of their losses The you know, for a fact that the leagues are going to have to pay a heavy penny. It's not going to be cheap to, you know, take a quarter of a city and just keep it for professional sports. But what's lucky is Las Vegas has thousands of thousands of thousands of rooms available for use right now because there's no one there to visit. So I think that's what makes this idea a plausible one. I'm not saying it's likely, but it's certainly one, I think, league, all four major leagues in America, and I'll, I'll, I guess five now, I'll include major league soccer, they should really take a look at this. Moving forward now, let's talk about the NBA. The gyms are slowly reopening. There's uh, rumors or sort of talk that uh, players will be allowed to individually or in small groups work out in NBA gyms. Same thing with hockey. It's expected that players can skate sometime in mid to late May, and June will be uh, some sort of training camp. That's sort of the, do- uh, the guidelines that we have so far for a potential return for both leagues. Noah, what do you see when you, when you see the NBA potentially reopening their gyms? What first comes to your mind? Well, I just think that it's the same. What we're what we're expecting or what we're theorizing is happening, and it's that it's going to be very like short practice and very like not not really hardcore practices in May. Yeah. Uh, actual training camps in June and sports in July. That's what we've been thinking yeah. might been happen. Thinking. Yeah, um, but uh, it's one. It's a step. It's, it's a step there needs First to be a step. lot more done, though. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know, it's definitely – we're definitely a long, long, long way from sports returning. Uh, we're talking at least 60 more days, even more. Um, because of this COVID-19 and it's just fluctuating, some days it looks like it's getting better. Some days it looks like it's going to be a second wave coming and hitting. So we don't know. It's such a fluid situation, right? So – Honestly, I expect the sports to return in some capacity in July or August, sometime in the summer. And I think it will probably be uh, in some way with a proposal just like MGM Resorts uh, proposed. It'll be some sort of uh, way like that. Like you looked at the NBA, um, National Basketball Association, not only looking at this proposal from Las Vegas, they're also looking at Disney World, Disneyland, et cetera, to host their games because it's the same idea. There's plenty of space for families to stay. So I think the common trend here is if the leagues are going to return, there's going to have to be a, a quarantine, quarantine uh, section for family and athlete to stay in. And that's the only way this is going to happen without, because I think if there's no possible way for families and athletes to stay uh, together, then there's no way the leagues open up. Not a chance. Not a chance. And on, honestly, um, if I was an athlete, why the hell would you not want to be with your family, right? It's in such a scary time. You need to be with your family. Day. They don't have that time much. So th- if they're going to be quarantined, if they're not going to be playing the sports that they're used to playing, then they're going to rather be with their family than play sports but not be able to spend that time. I, I just don't see it happening. Also, I just think I think it's just unfair to ask of these athletes to split it from their families. I would, I'd be like – who the, who the heck are you, right? Like, why would I split it from my family? Uh, you know, I know I have a contract uh, obligation, but come on. Like, I'm not going to leave my family stranded while I go across the world to play a sport. That's not fun or fair. Uh, I think just mor- morally, I think these leagues better come up with a way f- for families to stick together because it just – no one's interested in families being split apart, and let's, let's just work to a way uh, to avoid that, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Moving forward now, let's talk about a little bit of football and a couple other stories before we wrap up this shorter episode of the Best of Seven podcast. Firstly, Andy Dalton released. We all knew it was going to happen, but he signed with a team that we did not expect him to sign with. A lot of people thought the Patriots. They got it wrong. The Cowboys. Dallas Cowboys. Noah, as an Eagles fan, what are you thinking about this one? You know, I don't. Uh, he's the backup. That, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that gets injured. They're going to have a mediocre guy at quarter at quarterback. Uh, given he's probably one of the better backups in the league now, but yeah. it doesn't mean all that much. Uh, they're, they are paying a quarterback, which they were expected to do this offseason, but it was not <laughs> Dak. Yeah, it was not Dak, and we are still waiting on that ball to drop. Uh, franchise tag that um, he wants about $40 million. He's getting offered like eight or nine short of that, so – We'll see. Jerry Jones drafting on his beautiful yacht. Looks pretty comfortable. Doesn't look stressed. So if I'm a Cowboys fan, don't stress. I don't think Dak is leaving, but you never know. Maybe Andy Dalton is the next quarterback up, right? Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course. Speaking of another quarterback, Mr. Interception, Jameis Winston signs with the Saints. And this deal at first looks, why would he do that? Why would he not go to, you know, like the Patriots, uh, Chicago even, et cetera. And honestly, it's I, I'd like this for Jameis Winston uh, because he's gonna be coached by Sean Payton, one of the best in the game. He's gonna be mentored by Drew Brees, Drew Brees, pardon me, one of the best quarterbacks in the game ever. So this is just a great situation for him. And on top of that, Drew Brees has two years left. So it looks in like, in my opinion, Jameis Winston with all the skill that he has, Sean Payton, Drew Brees are gonna groom him into a tall, a talented quarterback who will limit his mistakes. I think in the next two years, he might be the future of the Saints because he has the skill, and I think Peyton and Breeze can really shape him into that quarterback. I think I think Jameis Winston, obviously, Jameis Winston is playing the long game here, which yes. he, he looked around for starting jobs right away. There weren't many open. There might have been the Patriots. There might have been teams Chargers. like the Chargers before yeah. they drafted their Herbert. quarterback. And so – he had a decision to make. What was he either going to go sign as a backup and hope that a guy gets injured and I guess get your time or go to a team that has an aging quarterback that is still going to be competitive after. And New Orleans just fits that right on. Like you said, he is getting coached by Sean Payton. Yes. He is getting mentored by Drew Brees. Yeah. He gets to play around a phenomenal dominant team like the New Orleans Saints, this can look pretty scary. They can, yeah. they can look really good, even after Breeze. And it's it, I'm, if there was one coach that can do it, Sean Payton would be the guy, either him or Bill Belichick. Yeah. Very good coaches. I think that he can groom Jameis Winston to stop making those mistakes and build on the talent that he already has. I, I think this can look really good for New Orleans. What I like about this the most is if I'm Jameis Winston, I'd be paying to get this experience. He's getting paid about 1.1 mil to play as the backup to one of the most dominant quarterbacks we've seen and one of the best coaches in National Football League history. So basically what this is going to do is I think this is going to be the turning point where Jameis Winston gets it all together and really shows what the potential he had coming out of college. He's going to finally live up to that potential in the National Football League. Moving forward now, Leonard Fournette, trade rumors, his fifth-year option declined by the Jaguars. What is Jacksonville doing? This guy is a young, talented running back. They drafted him like four years ago, and now they're trading him? What? I don't know what's what's going on in Jacksonville. <sighs> like, it's just more of a dumpster fire. There, there, there has to be internal conflict with uh, the management and the players, and the players want out. Yannick Ngakwe is still there. Yeah. And Leonard so. Fournette obviously wants out and I think it's yeah it's just part of the dumpster fire he'll sign with the new team he'll be great he's a good running back and I, I think he'll have a good future just not with the Jaguars you know it's unfortunate because listen you know Gardner Minshew he's a fine quarterback I like Minshew Mania I like the mustache you know I like the hype around him but you got to sort of round the guy with some talent and why would you trade a young running back who likes Jacksonville, who's dominated many times, and he's a, I'd say he's a top 10 running back in the game. They're probably going to end up drafting a running back in the next couple of years. So this is – like, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know what Jacksonville is doing. They are a joke, just like Urinating Tree said a few years ago, the forgotten lol cow 
of the National Football League, and they are back to being a basement dwelling wall cow. They've really messed up. They squandered the opportunity to, kin- to, to rekindle uh, that dominant team from 2017, I believe. 2017? Yeah. Yeah, so they missed on the opportunity. Uh, they traded Jalen Ramsey. They traded a bunch of guys. And you know what? Gordon Ramsey wasn't a fan of that Jalen Ramsey trade. And overall, the Jaguars, I don't know what they're doing. They're a mess. And if you're a Jags fan, I can relate. Because we traded away all our star players. And uh, it wasn't fun. Not fun at all, huh? No, no. It's still not fun knowing not that. Fun. So, but, so close. Just like Jacksonville was, both in the literally the, like the last, last round of the playoffs yeah. and just close. Close. It's it's yeah. it's just funny. Um how in two and a half years, I want to talk about this for a sec for Ottawa, just before we get to the next player. How in two and a half years Ottawa has gone like this. Whoa, they're, they're literally a goal away from double overtime game seven Eastern Conference Finals. Kunitz mm-hmm heartbreak and then everyone gets traded everyone gets traded everyone we're at rock bottom now we're talking boro boryevsky and melnick's uh weird interview that oh, went on sends twitter boy. that wow then terrible we're, then we draft break a chuck at first we're like holy cow that is terrible then we he turns out to be a stud drake batherson josh norris turns into a great player we get uh, a top five well top four pick now from san jose and all of a sudden ottawa has one of the best draft um uh, part, pardon me, prospect pools in the league, and they now have two of the top four picks in the draft. So there's a little they have so clap. many picks too. It's not just that oh, they have so like many. nine. What what is it? Nine picks. Nine in the first three, three rounds. rounds yeah. or seven in the first three rounds. They're, I think they have a ton. They have a pick from the absurd. Islanders. Another for that that first round three pick first. as well. The, Pierre Dorian did a great job acquiring those picks for sure. And it's funny looking back at it when Carlson was traded. You watched my sense talk video on the Carlson trade. And I was understandably losing my mind, right? Like, you traded a generational player. What the hell are you doing? And it turned out that he the Sanders won the trade, it looks like. Yeah. Like, the Sanders won the trade. And yeah. it's, it's just funny to look back that San Jose was one game away, one more win away, pardon me, from going to comp- a Stanley Cup final two, two years ago, which would have given Ottawa another first-round pick. They could have gotten two top picks. Crazy things happen in the National Hockey League. Not, no more than the Ottawa Sanders. No more. But nah, it looks like we are turning the page on futility, right? And hopefully the five years of unparalleled success that Melnick uh, promises will be coming soon. Let's move forward now to a player that should have offered plenty of success to uh, the Chicago Bears, a team that traded up with my San Francisco 49ers to draft Mitchell Trubisky. Before Patrick Mahomes, ladies and gentlemen, yes, Trubisky went before Mahomes. Second overall, and his fifth-year option was declined. Nick Foles looks to be the starting quarterback. Trubisky looks to be in trouble, Noah. What's going to happen with him? Oh, my goodness. I, I think he's going to go the Jameis Winston route just a couple years to, uh, a couple years before <laughs> Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston got a couple other chances. I don't think Trubisky deserves those chances. I don't think he'll get those chances. I think he'll be on the, I think he'll be on the market. Uh, it, unless he makes some phenomenal comeback, I just don't see it happening. Um, he, yeah, he's making like trade market or or free agent market. What do you mean by that? I I, I say free agent market. Free agent, and fresh start. You never know. Yeah. Some team's gonna gonna gamble on Mitchell Trubisky, but it's just been disappointment after disappointment for Mitch. I I can certainly see that, but I see him more of getting offers. He's gonna be expecting starting offers. I don't think he's gonna get any. Uh, he's proved that he's nothing more than mediocre at best. And that's at his best, mediocre, 500. So he's not a quarterback that will lead you to the Super Bowl. He's maybe a quarterback. I'll get you the odd 9-7 and seven season, 7-9, seven and 8-8. Nine, eight and eight. That's probably what you'll get. He's not dominant. He has a lot of flaws, and he doesn't really have a lot of attraction towards him. So I don't like him, and I'm really happy uh, the Niners traded it with uh, Chicago to get that the swap 2-3. and three. Unfortunately, the Niners dropped to Solomon Thomas with that pick, and that hasn't really worked out either, but I digress. The Bears drafted Trubisky over Mahomes, and that's what's going to be known for years to come, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just been disappointing. Second overall pick. Yeah. To the bin. To the bin. Well, like one playoff game, didn't even win it. Well, the, to be fair, they probably should have won that game. But well, What was the score? What was the score? 
Who you had tell more me. All I, all I remember is Who had more points in the end of the game? Who had more points in the end of the game? That's all I okay, see. Okay, technically you guys, but to be fair, the field goal was at like at the 25, and he hit the post, post, bang, out. Yep. I've never seen something so stupid. I can just imagine your reaction while watching that. I, I jaw dropped. I didn't believe it. I thought, you, I thought it was done. You lost your mind, eh? I, I lost my mind. Yeah. I would have lost my mind too. That's literally one of the most legendary moments in Eagles history, in my opinion. And it didn't even, it's what's funny is it, it didn't even involve the them. Yeah. It wasn't even about, oh, actually not even true though. Cause I believe one of the Eagles defenders. Blocked yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. He, he got a finger on it. So realistically it wasn't a missed field goal. It was a blocked field goal, right but, defense, but it's more fun but, to say you missed yeah, the, field the, goal. The, the, the Bears fans are always going to say it was the kicker's fault. Then. And, and, and after I think it was Cody Parkey, right? Yeah. After Cody Parkey missed that kick, there was no way he was getting another National Football League drop. No, no matter how bad he was, which he was he was pretty bad. He missed a lot of field goals. There was no way, just by the reputation he, alone, he was done. done. He got he got another sure. offer. He played for the Titans. Yeah. I don't know if he still does or he did I think he's on the Raiders now. Yeah, I, I but he, he's bounced around, but he got released right away from the Bears. Yeah. What I'm what, all I'm saying is I don't know if you can ever live that live up from that again. That's just whew. But, but here's the thing about that Bears team. It wasn't even Trubisky. It, it was it wasn't the offense. The quarterback wasn't good. The running backs were okay. The receivers weren't that great. There were some, like Allen Robinson's a good receiver, but yeah, then what they were known for was the defense. And that's what Still won might. them those twelve games, ten games, eleven games. That's what I got them so twelve. High. I think they won twelve and four. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it was the defense, the Khalil oh, Mack, yeah. phenomenal Chicago Bears defense. It was not that that offense. Huh. And so that just shows that Mitchell Trubisky, even with an elite defense, can't get it done and needs another opportunity. It was, def- without a doubt, the top defense in the league at the time. It kind of fell off last year, mostly because of that offense just was brutal and the play calling was terrible. Um, I'm not a Bears fan, so I didn't watch every game, but I know that the only reason they were in most games and the only reason they were close to making the playoffs until the final couple of weeks was a Khalil Mack and that dominant defense uh, because that offense couldn't score for anything for their life. It was brutal uh, to watch. Uh, finally, Corey Davis also got his fifth-year option decline. Noah, what's your comment on that? I, he, he's he's, deg- he's uh, regressed uh, significantly. Uh, he was the fifth overall pick, obviously, by the Tennessee Titans. Uh, they had a big uh, hopes for him, and he's just – he hasn't quite hit the mark. He's not taken with injuries. Um, I, there, there have been guys who have just uh, surpassed him in well, potential yeah. and the ceiling, and he doesn't really have much of a place with the team. Well, what I'll say about Corey Davis is I believe um, – I'll look this up just before I say it because I don't want to be wrong. I believe he is a running back, and – um he's a receiver oh he's a receiver oh, yeah. okay that, that's i i got i forgot what his name was i got it mixed up anyways um the tennessee titans they didn't need him they didn't need him so they didn't offer the fifth year and you know what it doesn't mean he's not going to be resigned it just means show us something to make us want to bring you back right so we'll see i'm sure Corey davis will definitely be offered some depth options i can see a team like green bay trying to get him because just to shore up that wide receiver depth, just throwing a team out there just off the top of my head. But obviously knowing how they don't like Aaron Rodgers, they'll probably just pick up another quarterback. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> moving forward now back to hockey for the last couple um, points. Yaroslav Halak, one of the best backup goaltenders in the National Hockey League, signed a one-year extension with the Boston Bruins at $2.25 million. Noah, what do you think of Halak in Beantown? Yeah, so they secure that backup. He's played a crucial role for them this season, and he's played a crucial role for them the past season as well. Yeah, um, he, He's one of the best backups in the league, like you said. Him with Anton Kudobin, Pavel Franku from the Colorado Avalanche. They're, they're, it, this year has been a, the year of the goaltender, I'd say. Sure. Where there were a lot of points scored by, like, forwards and stuff, but it, the spotlight is on these brand-new goalies that no one's ever heard of Better. exploding onto the scene. And yeah. Marcus Hogberg, you got Pavel Franku. There are other guys. Igor Shesterkin from the yeah. uh, New York Rangers. Even – even um, what's his name from the Rangers as well? It starts with an H. Um, Honka – no, no, not, no, not Honka. Sorry, I'm, that's from my Be a Pro in Hockey. I'm thinking of uh, Alex uh, like Georgiev. Georgia, that was so embarrassing. My be a pro came to my mind. That was my backup. 
with my Rangers but, team, sorry. But like Georgia, it's yeah. The, it's been the year of the backup goalie, and it's yeah. looked pretty good. A lot of young rookie goalies have been also called up. Yeah. Um, there have been guys that have blossomed, like Carter Hart, Jordan yeah. Bennington, getting into really that starting role. And I have Seattle, the Seattle general manager is licking his chops right now, picking sure. a goalie. <laughs> He has so many options for, for sure. a potential goalie to pick. There's so many teams with double goalies. Elias Samsonov is another Casey, one for Washington. Casey DeSmith, Tristan Yari, yeah. Matt Murray in Pittsburgh, three cal- starting caliber goalies. Uh, one's a two-time Stanley Cup champion, another's an all-star. Casey DeSmith is definitely a starter in the NHL. I don't know what Pittsburgh's going to do, but at least one of them is getting traded at, at least. I don't see how one yeah. of them is going to get traded. Pittsburgh might lose two goalies, two expansion drafts, in like five years that's crazy yeah. but that tells you something about their development for goaltending right yeah that tells the, their, that they tells have a something. they have a knock for good goaltenders they had philip gustafson as well who they traded to ottawa so they had hopefully, a stacked goalie roster yeah, yeah. and hopefully gustafson really turns it around too you know he's had a he had a really good year this year actually to be honest yeah uh, compared to others and you know like you know as well uh goalies really take a while to develop mm-hmm. so i'm not worried about gustafson i know a lot of people are I don't know. I don't think you are either. I'm not. Right? Yeah. I'm not. We don't if need he, him right yeah. now. We don't need him. We have we have Hogberg for now. If if Hogberg gets to that point where he demands an absurd amount of money, like in the whatever sixty seven million dollar range, then sorry, we can't do that for you. We have young guys coming up, and it is what it is. But for now, yeah. for next season, for the season after, probably as well, Hogberg's our guy. Exactly. I think Hogberg is the future in the net for Ottawa. But if you look at Gustafson, if he's still not really progressing in the next two to three years, then I would begin to get worried. But goalies generally take a while. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a while for goalies. Goalies, sometimes they can just come up and dominate, stuff like Andrew Hammond, and then flash out. Sometimes they have consistent winning, like Carter Hart. And then sometimes they have, you know, they just can't play well until it just snaps and they start doing really well. So it, go- goalies are always a mystery in developing. There's no telling how or how or how or how long it will take but rest assured i think philip gustafson has a bright future in big show um a couple of last notes george larock a former habs forward uh diagnosed with COVID 19 he mentioned that it's one of the worst sicknesses he's ever had he's having trouble breathing he can't get up without uh, losing his breath so that's really scary uh we are obviously hoping he recovers fully and you know just obviously our thoughts and prayers you know it's a terrible disease what's going on and you know it's he's clearly struggling he's saying he's struggling and you know we we know he can he can bite some people in the nhl he really was able to throw the punches let's see if he can really i he will if he can throw the punches in the nhl he's going to punch the hell out of COVID 19 in my opinion yeah we obviously prayers to georgia's and yeah his whole family and i think he'll be I think he can uh, beat this virus for sure. For sure. Because he beat plenty of people in the NHL. The guy can fight for sure. And he's going to fight this thing. Uh, Lastly, my beard's a little bit – you shaved. My beard's kind of smaller. If you're not – if you're on – if you're listening, say it again. Smooth. (laughs) Smooth, smooth. Mine's a little bit uh, prickly. But what I'll say is uh, if you're not watching this on YouTube, go over to this after you're done listening to the audio um, if you want to see what our beards look like. Uh, so Joe Thornton, famous for his beard that goes like up to here. I'm not nearly as close. I got like not yet. No, I've got like maybe uh, years and years and years left, less. buddy. Years <laughs> and years. I got years and years off, but I have started, so I'm getting there. Uh, but the breaking news out of San Jose: Joe Thornton he shaved his beard, and he looks completely different, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. That is a weird sight. A weird one. It's like imagine Brent Burns being without a beard. What would that look like? Exactly. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to. He he should have that beard forever. And I think that's a great way to wrap it up, Noah. Why don't you tell everyone where they can follow us on social media and where they can listen to us on our uh, streaming platforms? All right. So you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Sense Talk Podcast, and then we're streaming everywhere. We're on Spotify. We're on Google Play. We're on SoundCloud. We're on Apple and streaming uh, at the Best of Seven podcast, obviously. And um, obviously on YouTube at Sense Talk. And uh, we appreciate we appreciate when you're hitting that red button, making, it, making gray. it gray. There we go. There we go. Make that red button, make it gray. We just passed 640. Let's get, get to 650 subscribers. Um, you know, once again, looking forward to Scott Saber in the next couple of weeks. 
Uh, looking forward to next week to watch episode number five and six of the Last Dance documentary, seeing Kobe Bryant. Noah, I'll see you next week. Everybody, thank you so much for listening uh, and watching. We'll see you all next week. Stay home, stay safe, and stay healthy. And that is it for episode number seven of the Best of Seven podcast. See y'all next week.